had had pushed. Um, sorry for the interruption there. I just realized I promised I was going to record it and forgot, so I started. So anyway, thank you. So so um, go ahead, Fred. So they 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 had, were interested in inside. Uh, Are we frozen? Not, again? not they were interested in that teacher in a way and how he conveyed. <clears throat> <clears throat> was more interested in the book. And the whole thing is that insight occurs only when you have questions. And you only have questions when they occur to you. You can't make yourself ask a question, a real question. But if you have a question in relation to some circumstance, Bingo, sometime there might emerge the answer to the question, which is an insight, which you then can formulate and so forth. So I was working with Cofield and while I was first dipping into insight, this would be bet between my uh, first and second years of philosophy at St. John's Seminary. And, and I, uh, and, and we were all sent out to different backyards in the neighborhood, which is a mainly black and Hispanic parish, overwhelmingly black. And, and I was teaching, we all had to teach vacation Bible school. And so I was there teaching vacation Bible school in this wonderful black family who taught me for the first time what I didn't realize before that insofar as I was uncomfortable with blacks, it had to do with only the cases where they weren't middle class. But this was a middle class family with four kids and the father who worked two or I think maybe three jobs. And they lived right across from a project. And the project was something you didn't want to go near because the smell of rotting meat in the sewer was so strong. But anyway, I did go over there and I got to know the janitor there, who was a poor guy who lived on salami sandwiches on white bread. And they had one of his big problems was people moving out and leaving their apartments in disarray. And they couldn't, he he didn't he didn't have the energy or the time to to, to, to redo those. So I got the idea that of, of uh, maybe after I finished vacation Bible school, I could, which only lasted for a few weeks, I could go to the person who ran this place and ask for money to clean out the apartments and to repaint them and so forth, which he kind of was stunned but said yes. So I kind of rounded up kids from the neighborhood, teenage kids, uh, some of whom who were on probation. So I was in contact with their probation officers. And, and we started to do those jobs and kind of during breaks, we would have Bible study. And every night, Cofield would call all of us together in the evening and ask us, well, what's going on in your vacation Bible study place? And basically, the, most of them were in the position of doing their vacation Bible study job, but not really connecting very well with whoever they were teaching. And basically, not too much was happening, but I had I had this experience of getting one insight into the concrete after another and starting this whole project so that we cleaned out apartments and eventually Father Cofield came and said mass in one of the empty apartments on the first floor and people would drop in and so forth and so on. Uh, and after he did that for a couple of weeks, Cardinal McIntyre said, uh, this sounds too much like communism. Oh, Brian. So you have to stop it. 
it kind of broke my heart. Oh, oh yeah, jeez. Oh. And and uh, I was really scandalized. That was really um, just an awful experience. But what I realized that reading Insight and going to Cofield's conversations, he was really asking us. He was really dealing with us, not in the way of telling us what to do, but what are you learning on your situation and what's what's going to come of it? Mm -hmm. And I was the only one that anything came of it besides vacation Bible school. So, so I realized, well, wait a minute. All the things I'm, I've been learning from Lonergan, this is the way Cofield operates. He asks and asks, answers questions, practical questions, and figures out, well, what should I do? And deliberates on them, not strategize, but deliberate. Whereas someone like Whirl would have been strategic. I don't know whether he ever deliberated in his life. You sometimes doubt it. But, but, um, so, so I was sold on insight. And then when I, when I got on the same boat, I think that you took, uh, Tom, yeah. I, I, uh, I was told by a, a fellow who met me and was interested in Lonergan too, that Lonergan was teaching there. And so I didn't realize that. Huh. So when I got there I, at table, you remember, George, you'd have conversations with different people and it'd be a chance to ask people questions. Right. And finally, people said, well, why don't you just go see Lonergan yourself? And I would have never thought of doing that. But then I got up my courage and did it. And that was the beginning of a wonderful converse, conversation that got to go on for years. And so what Lonergan always did was many times when I'm asking questions, he'd say, well, do you know German? And I said, no. But luckily, I did know Spanish. And the Spanish were German lovers who translated their books rather well. So I could read Koreff and other people in Spanish. But I realized if I really was serious about being a theologian, I'd have to go to the study in the German speaking context, because that's where 20th century, century theology was really um, in Gamba, on the ball. Mm -hmm. So I studied at the University of Basel. And what happened was uh, Matt Lamb was also like me, but he finished his licentiate first because he was a Trappist um, and committed to his vocation. And he got the bug too. And he ended up uh, getting permission to leave the Trappist. And, and he went to um, study with ultimately Metz in uh, Münster. And he would, he would come down. I, when I had a child and he would come down and be with us for a few days at a time. And we get to talk about so many things we had in common. But eventually we got the invitation from a student of uh, a guy named Bernie Terrell, uh, who inherited a lot of money and he wanted to put on a big conference for Lonergan. And uh, he did so in Florida, in which he invited all kinds of important theologians and people from all disciplines to Florida for what turned out to be a week-long conference. Oh, yeah. Wasn't that like 1970 or something? Exactly. Yeah. And so I, I, uh, I gave a talk there. And as soon as I, because I gave that talk there, people... Uh, the ones I remember more specifically are a guy named Frederick Crossan and Dave Burrell at Notre Dame, and then Les Orsi, at uh, who eventually was at 
uh, Catholic U, and um, and others started writing me and asking me would I come to their place. But the but there were two people from BC who had a lot of, uh, especially one of them had a lot of say in who would get hired about what. And and so um, it was Joe Flanagan, who was also a Lonergan fanatic. And he, he, uh, he really encouraged me to come there. And he said, well, we're gonna get Dave Tracy and Joe Kamanchak there. And I said, well, hell, there are no two people I'd rather be with than them. So I signed up and that was really how I got there uh, uh -huh. because of Flanagan. He convinced his associate who was the de chair of theology hire him. And so that was the beginning. That, that was the real beginning. There was no, I was not a uh, big fish in a small pond in any, by any means. I, I was together with a lot of brilliant people, uh, especially the Dutch guys, but others too. And yeah, eventually- but that, must have been, but that must have been quite a talk you gave. Yeah, it was 15 you... minutes. <laughs> I don't no, get it. It was a, the original TED talk. <laughs> but, 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 but really what happened was that um, Dave Burrell was, we, you know, that thing of breaking out into groups. Yeah. Dave Burrell accidentally landed in some of the groups where I was too. And so I think he had a lot of, a lot of influence on Fred Crossan, who was also there. So that was really it. I, I think, uh, uh, there's a lot of romanticizing of my past, <laughs> uh, which is not exactly true. Well, but nothing I, did, I, I did become an important part of the theology department. There's no doubt about it. And I had the good luck to have Sean as my doctoral student who attended my classes and I directed her dissertation and so forth. Sean Copeland. Oh yes, and yeah. she she's she's an amazing person. Yeah, why don't you describe her to the group? I really don't know much about her except that uh, I think she's isn't there a, a seminary that she's at Chandler? Is she still at Maybe BC? A scholar there, yeah. Now, yeah, uh, but she's an African American woman theologian, right? Exactly. She's from Detroit and was a Sister of Mercy oh. of the Detroit Division. I see. And I remember one time uh, taking a walk with Rick Cassidy, uh, who was our classmate uh, there. And I was telling him how I'm, I'm going to invite Sean Copeland to come to the Lonergan workshop. And Rick, I always remember him saying, Sean Copeland, because he was the director of uh, their, their justice department in the diocese there. And and he knew she was famous uh, already. And it was really something to have her not only come to the workshop, but to eventually come to BC where she lost her sisterly vocation, but she became a leading scholar uh, 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 among what, it, what are called black theologians. And, and she is, uh, just an incredibly talented writer and speaker and super involved in all the racial issues that we're all caught up into now in a special way. And uh, just, a, just a wonderful colleague and person. Uh, she started teaching at different colleges and eventually she gravitated uh, to come back to BC and uh, what a wonderful thing that was. So, so um, eventually a lot of people came to BC, uh, including my dissertation. Uh, I did my dissertation on Gadamer and Lonergan because Lonergan always talked about Gadamer and his method in theology exercitatio courses at the Greg, which I attended. 
and that was after I stopped attending classes at all uh, at BC because by and large, the lecturers were, guy, were just guys who were pretty much repeating what they had in their Latin textbooks. It, yeah, and, so you uh, mean at the Greg, at the Greg, you stopped going, Greg, yeah. And, and uh, as, as Lonergan used to joke, uh, the Greg, the teachers at the Greg seem to have forgotten that the invention of the electric light bulb and the printing press, <laughs> you could read their notes. And if, if a person was just doing their notes, then you didn't need to attend, which wasn't really kosher, but that's what I did. I stayed home and worked on different, on different things. And you had to pay the skits to issues. Uh, no, so well, that was later, that was yeah. later. So my Sue is here right beside me and she's-, she's Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. I had to pay. She, they're all saying hello to you, Sue. Oh. <laughs> um, and she just said you have you had to pay tuitions, which is uh, one of the blessings that I knew German, so I could translate books in order to pay school tuitions, since ah. the Boston schools were so shoddy at that time. All the wonderful the Irish the white schools were shoddy. The Boston's public schools. Oh, okay. Or Catholic schools too, but anyway. So anyway, that 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 was it. She she's uh, um, just a wonderful person and a wonderful theologian. And she she uh, she really does look at the whole race problem uh, in the shadow of the cross. Uh, and she understands that the shadow of the cross, uh, according to the best Catholic understanding, is not a not a theology of penal substitution, but really a, a, a gesture of God's friendship uh, in, in a way that doesn't come into penalties at all. It's taking care of the sin rather than the sinners. Absolutely. And inviting people to become friends uh, and in a certain sense, sharing his pain uh, to overcome sin was good, which is uh, not a very favorite activity of many Americans. So, so, uh, but I always distinguish, as I think I wrote to uh, Tom, the priests of Yahweh from the priests of Baal. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And I'm so happy to be together with people who meant to be or actually are priests of Yahweh. And you, and as Sue always points out, uh, not long after I really decided I was going to be a teacher in my third year in Rome, uh, I, I met her. And as she sometimes points out, you never really lost your vocation which I think would be true of George and Ned and so forth. So, so, um, and I think so many people who left in the 60s and 70s had that vocational attitude. And um, for one reason or another, uh, uh, someone said, uh, you can't put live hens, live chicks under a dead hen, which is, was his analogy of churches in general. <laughs> so, so, uh, so apt. Wow. So, so, so there is that way in which uh, people could have good reasons for deciding to leave. I, I, I think I share some of those. It's anyway. kind of like the, the diaspora. Yeah. Sending, yeah, yeah. So I always, uh, George did it with marriage mediation, and in many other ways. And I'm sure, as a as a lawyer, George did it, and so forth. So, 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 um, uh, it, it, it's it's a wonderful circumstance that there are so many people, good priests, and also really good lay people. 
Um, hey, well, I wonder, okay. uh, we've struck up a collective acquaintance with a young priest here who's Archbishop Gomez's, um, I, I don't know what to call it, supervisor. Uh, well, um, what's the term at the chancery office? Um, uh, evangelization? Well, no, I was going to say Chingon in Spanish, but I can't think of. Uh, he's. Is he a had, chauffeur? Uh, huh? His chauffeur? No, no, no. He's head of all the pastoral programs. Okay. And he's a young guy. He's been a priest about five years. And he tells us that our generation of guys who are still priests are just splendid fellows you know, dedicated and, and uh, engaged, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, not anxious to retire. Um, and, uh, and but that the young priests are kind of uh, restorationists, I guess. I don't, I don't know exactly what to call them, but very anti-Francis um, and um, Lazy. And, the, uh, and, and then the ones after them are the ones that are lazy, the guys in their 40s and 50s. He describes in this archdiocese, at least, as very disengaged. Um, right. So is, do you see any such patterns, Fred, if, if you're a student or uh, anywhere? Well, I, I think I wrote to Tom that I had the experience of... Uh, being called back to uh, Frank Rowan's 50th anniversary of ordination. Yeah, yeah. I think I sent that to all of you, didn't I? Oh, then you know. So, so uh, I don't think I didn't we see lived, it. We, we lived right across the street from the diocesan seminary here. And um, my son registered what I saw myself that. Um, what a difference between the people that gathered together at Frank's ordination to celebrate with him and the people you'd meet in the seminary at his time. So, so, so there's this um, uh, really almost in the first 20 years, well, Lonergan had a wonderful sta statement. He said, after the church has been sitting on the lid for 400 years, there's bound to be an explosion. <laughs> and I think that's what happened in the first two decades after the, after the council. And so you had people who uh, were really becoming derailed and, and, and then, and so you had the people who, uh, have a conservative bent that were very upset by that and I think overreacted against it. And that continues as, you, as George pointed out with the attitude towards Francis. Mm -hmm. um, the, they, uh, he came from Argentina where there's a, where the political theology is a teología del pueblo. And he has the smell of the sheep on him and he's more like the way Gomez uh, interpreted the people that were more or less our contemporaries um, who, who were really engaged um, and and uh, and so the people who were worried about holding down the fort so to speak uh, they weren't altogether without justification because there were great abuses and stupid things that were done. But on the other hand, uh, that was no reason to have this tremendous reaction against the council and so forth that came up and having this whole idea that uh, all the people who talked about doing things in the spirit of the council were more or less the spawn of the devil. Uh, that 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 really was an overreaction the other way. But um, one good thing about Lonergan is he talked about bias. 
And bias is, is, is mainly the reason why people uh, close off questions. Uh, don't ask further questions. And, and so you have the internecine squabble between the conservatives in the church and the so-called liberals in the church who aren't necessarily liberal at all, but they are thought of as liberal, stereotyped. And it's a kind of internecine warfare. And it's a sad, sad state of affairs in the church today. Uh, it doesn't seem anywhere, you would think that this long after the council, it would have been assimilated by the church? Or am I naive? I mean, uh, what, what was the council over, 65? 62 to 65. I was yeah. there for the last three sessions. Yeah. Um, the, and it 55, was- 55, 56 years ago. It was, it was, uh, and a wonder, an amazing opportunity to be there at the time. Uh, Fred, wouldn't you say that continental theology had a lot to do with the good results of the council? Oh, oh sure. First, why don't we understand uh, continental theology? <laughs> oh, what really is true, there, there were two aspects of it. One was a movement that started way back in the late 20s and early 30s in places like Span uh, France and Germany, where, where they went back to the writings of the fathers of the church. Yes. And, and what the church, they had a sense of what the church was like when it, when it uh, you could say the pre-bureaucratic church. Yeah. The more pastoral church. So one of the great one of the great movements that affected the council from day to day, really, through the people who were chosen to be pariti for the bishops, mm. were on the one hand, what they called les sourcements, going back to the sources in a historical, critical way. And on the other hand, a giardamento, which has to do with, well, we really need to renew the church, and we can't keep sitting on the lid, so to speak. But most of the people um, uh, that that uh, phrase somebody used, company men, the people that got chose chosen bishops after Paul the sixth were pretty much company men, and they were, in a way, brought up under a uh, bureaucratically organized church, where unfortunately the mission of the church uh, became a, a little bit, not totally, but a little bit subordinated to power. And that's what bureau bureaucra bureaucracy is about. The pecking order leading up to the pinnacle of the bishop or the cardinal and so forth and so on. And so when, when Whirl was uh, decided to resign from being a uh, ordinary in Washington, DC, my class had a big uh, correspondence on uh, email correspondence about the thing because we had feelings in all different directions about Whirl. Um, and and guys who are still priests would say that they had noticed cases of, say, sex, sex abuse on, on the part of priests in the diocese. And they told their bishops about it. And the bishops just didn't do anything about it. They, they covered it up. So you have that sort of betrayal on the first level of the priests and the people who are supposed to find them trustworthy in every respect. And on the second level, the second level of cover up. And apparently, as you can see from Francis's last uh, movement about really take, uh, reporting people to the authorities, secular authorities, 
that he wants to end that. And in a certain sense, he's, he's admitting that it did go all the way up. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> up the ladder. And of course, there was always the justification that if you did anything very public, it would cause scandal. <coughs> but <coughs> they failed to recognize what an awful effect that whole thing had on the church at large, um, which was even more scandalous, let's yeah. say. So, so um, <coughs> that's the way I think I, I see it. Um, I don't. I, I don't necessarily think Francis is always right about everything, and I don't care if people are always right. I I care if they're trying, mm -hmm. because coming to know the right course of action is a self-correcting process. So he started off, in a certain sense, fending off the people who said that the the Vatican was complicit. But as time went on, he realized, well, no, no, it has been complicit. So let's do something different <laughs> for a change. Uh, not, every, not everybody goes along with it, but, but he's making a start and he, he's, he's a learner um, and in a wonderful way. So I admire him tremendously. He's, he's also, I think, a very cagey ecclesiastical politician. I wouldn't doubt that. No. I don't think he could have been Pope without that. Yeah, that's the Jesuit, I guess. <laughs> but, but maybe we could spend some time, you guys, talking about your lives a little bit. They aren't as interesting, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could... You know, you could talk about the Jesuit connection that you found, George, for example, and Ned with uh, Herbert Ryan. It Herbert. seems like, Fred, it seems like the Jesuits are a connection throughout all of our lives in some sense. And Tom yeah, Walbers is probably true. an honorary Jesuit. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. My spiritual well, direction I'm, has been under I'm, Jesuit. I'm, yeah. I've been Greg Boyle with yeah. Homeboy Industries. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Oh man. So it sounds like the Jesuits have been the salvation. You know, St. Ignatius has really been up there pulling some strings, you know, <laughs> kind of. But it sounds like uh, the Jesuits, do you think they're more reflective or that the, the Ignatian exercises, Fred and, and Sue, since you live among Jesuits there, uh, are very significant and that yeah. they foster a depth that maybe wouldn't be there otherwise? Well, 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 Fred, are we going to get to, to see Sue? Uh, can we behold her if she's next like to you? I would like to see you. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> feeling just Hello. Hi Hi there. Hi, Welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was, uh, I always tell kids, when you get married, try to marry someone smarter than you are. <laughs> I lucked out. I lucked out. You know, you know, Fred. When when uh, everybody uh, when I was in the seminary, uh, uh, my dad used to tell me stories about the Jesuits in um, El Paso. Uh, there was a Sacred Heart Church there that was um, run by the the Jesuits, and he got into several uh, education programs that they uh, put on. And at one point, when uh, I got uh, to theology, um, he and I sat together and we're talking and he said, you know, son, do you really want to be a priest? <laughs> I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm not really absolutely certain yet. But yeah, I, I mean, I'm still hanging in there. And he said, well, then why don't you be a real priest? And I said, what do you mean by that? He says, a Jesuit, of course, a Jesuit. They're the real priests. Uh, and uh, uh, then told me some stories about uh, Padre Ricarde and, and several other priests uh, there at uh, Sacred Heart Church. Um, uh, so when, 
when George Crook and I made the acquaintance of uh, Herb Ryan uh, from Loyola Marymount, uh, who I guess he'd been there for 25 years, had, didn't he? Uh, hadn't he, George? Uh, almost. He got there in 1973. Yeah, yeah. For, for whatever reason, uh, he, uh, he took to us, and, and, or, or we to him, and we pursued him, and he, he surrendered and, and, and was just a lifelong friend. Very brilliant. Um, how, how would you uh, describe it, George? Well, uh, I think you did just fine. Uh, Fred, he was the secretary to John Courtney Murray at the Vatican Council. Once Spellman decided he wanted Murray to be his uh, peritus, um, uh, Herbert and uh, Murray went to the council together. And so Herbert was there for all of it and wound up, uh, no, they missed the first session because Spellman and I guess decided he was gonna blaze a path to uh, 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 freedom of conscience and so forth yet, you know. Um, and um, in fact, Herbert had a great story. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> he, he went to the church, uh, the Polish church in Rome, I guess, St. Stanislaus, on the feast of that saint, who was a Jesuit. Uh, and uh, uh, the sacristan comes out and asks him if he'll serve mass for this visiting Polish bishop. And he said, well, yeah, sure. So it was Wojtyla, and um, um, Herbert and Wojtyla spoke in French afterwards, the, the language they had in common. And Wojtyla says, so father, what are you doing here? You know, that type of chit chat. And Herbert says, well, I'm the secretary to uh, uh, John Courtney Murray. And then Herbert would imitate the Pope say, well, you know Murray? And uh, Herbert said, yes, you, you, you know, and can I meet him? And well, let me see. So give me your phone number. And that is Murray said, sure, tell him to come on by. So uh, wait, according to Herbert, uh, who could embellish a bit from time to time, uh, Waitila <laughs> and, and Murray stayed up till three in the morning <clears throat> talking. And the next day, uh, Waitila gets up uh, and does this intervention at the council. Um, I think it was the last day of that session. I'm not sure that. It says, I cannot go back to totalitarian nation representing totalitarian church. And it was, you know, his declaration of support of uh, 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 Nostra Aetate, mm -hmm. um, which was uh, important to the development of it, I guess, and uh, helped it blitz through the council, right? It get carried resoundingly. Um, so that was Herbert. He 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 thought Lonegren was uh, would have been far far better known had his local bishop had the sense to ask him to be his peritus at the council, hmm. but for whatever reason the guy didn't, and Lonegren stayed in wherever he was. What I don't know, what province he was in, but he was in Canada, wasn't he? Uh, uh, yeah, but. Yeah. Uh, Toronto and yeah first in uh, Quebec which is the province he was born in and then later on at Toronto when the, when the English speaking Jesuits and the French speaking Jesuits. Uh -huh. Do you think uh, Fred did, did Lonergan was he diagnosed with cancer in 63 or 64? Yes. Do you think that had something to do with his not being there at the council? Oh probably probably yeah, yeah. I'm not sure he he uh, thought he was called to that. Mm. Um, he, it was during that period that he wrote, um, he, he taught both the Trinity and Christology at the Greg. And the thesis 17 is on the redemption. And he wrote a wonderful, redo of the redemption book during that time that you're speaking and i bet he wanted to stay with it i don't know though well it's uh it was cardinal cardinal uh, martini 
who became very close to the Lonergan group, said that in, in some ways he was an important background influence upon the council. Oh, really? Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to mention that when George told me about Herb, Herbert Ryan, I, I, I went immediately and read his, his uh, obituary uh, composed by the Jesuits. And boy, what, what an edifying person he was, how learned, how many languages he could read and speak. It's just unbelievable to me. And, and I thought, what a wonderful providential thing that you guys got to, to have him as a spiritual guide. Oh, yeah. No question about it. <laughs> so uh, I have a former law partner who is an atheist. I mean, he is an atheist. And he had met Herbert on a few occasions. Uh, uh, he had him over for dinner. Uh, Etc. And this Bob Caravan and and he and Ellen uh, became very fond of Herbert. And I sent Bob the eulogy to uh, no the uh, what do you call it in the Times the not the epitaph obituary obituary, no. obituary. yeah thanks. Um, and Bob said after reading it he said I would have added just another clause. And I thought, was that? And he said, I would have said he had a tremendous capacity for friendship. Hmm. And he did, you know. Well, that kind of fits in with the theme, uh, Fred, of grace and friendship and your emphasis on that conversation and friendship. It sounds like that's what you did, George, when you invited Ryan to meet with your colleague, you created a conversation. Yeah. yeah, and a friendship. Uh, that, he also, yeah, that, I was just say he also went out uh, with my atheist Jewish doctor from Cedars, uh, Don Nortman. Uh, we went and saw the movie Europa Europa, which was about the randomness of death during the Holocaust, I guess. Um, and uh, they to this day the doctor remembers him very fondly um you know and herbert's been dead now 11 years but what a, what what a problem thing was that your father said at least talk to a jesuit <laughs> <laughs> you got a real live one <laughs> Yeah, he, George, uh, George and I are going to be having uh, lunch uh, or dinner probably uh, on Monday with uh, Father Tom Rausch, uh, who's uh, uh, a theologian in residence at uh, at Loyola. Um, we can't we can't get uh, enough of those guys. Yeah. You know, Rausch uh, is also the co-chair of the Archdiocesan uh, Theological Commission. Yes. Yes, we're going we're gonna to talk a little about we'll that. Put out, <laughs> put out that excellent statement. I think I... I think yeah, you I did. Uh, it's, it's very good. Uh, uh, the, uh, what Ned said, we, we were going to talk to Rauch with some emphasis. Uh, we're very concerned, uh, 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 we in this group anyway, about Archbishop Gomez. Um, you know, leading the scalping party, uh, Eucharistic, uh, what's they, what do they call it? Eucharistic coherence, uh, scalping party for Joe Biden, uh, you know, and, or possibly so in the uh, National Bishops Conference. Um, what do you think of that, Fred? Of, of if the bishops were to say to Biden, I don't go to communion. Well, oh, I'm on the side of Thomas Aquinas, who said that the, the res, the, the specific grace connected with the Eucharist is the unity of the mystical body of Christ. So if you have any reason for keep, keeping someone apart from that sacrament, it better be a good one. And I don't think that's a good one. Oh. So, and I, and I think using it, uh, People use the phrase, but I'm 
I feel like emotionally it feels appropriate that they're weaponizing the Eucharist. Mm. Uh, that that is so so much of a failure to realize what the what the point of the Eucharist really is. Fred, uh, I, I could you um, tell us, given your vantage point there at BC and and having the, the network of uh, of good. Uh, friends uh, elsewhere. What do you think about the uh, the intellectual life of our bishops and cardinals in the United States? I mean, to to have to have proposed that and and uh, almost gotten to a point of of um, discussing it so seriously as to as to uh, appear to. Uh, be in agreement with it until Va the Vatican uh, interrupted and said, be very careful. And when you read that uh, uh, letter that was written, uh, it, it's basically saying, stop, think, don't do anything until you hear from, from us, is basically what I interpreted the thing to say. But how... As Father Colfield would have said, Ned, uh, they're saying observe judge act <laughs> i don't think i don't yeah cofield would have said or don't that. act but 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 what fred do you think about the intellectual uh, well just just the, the 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 thoughtfulness the 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 uh sense of 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 appropriate theology uh uh that would that should underpin be the foundation of uh of the care of the pastors who are cardinals and bishops in our in our church i i i, I could go on but I, I what do you think i hope i've made some sense well uh you'd make a lot of sense and i think a thing that i become increasingly aware of is how much institutions shape us that you may even be going into an institution like the college of cardinals or the castries or even the diocese and bishop and and uh think you're going to really bring things in the right direction but before you get to change anything you're being changed by the institution and if you're in an authoritarian institution, precisely that unwillingness to take into account the, the, the possibilities of deliberation on the part of the people in the church and not just the clergy or the hierarchy, that, that's just a losing proposition. But it has an awful lot to do with, with uh, the way seminaries are set up. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, when I was in our seminary system, I, I didn't feel unfree oh, to think, yes. to ask questions. Uh, it's partly because I was probably somehow overlooked. But uh, what they did notice was that I was so disorganized. So every seminary I ever went to, I eventually became a sacristan in order to get in order. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Tom Wellers too. That, that I'll, I'll John me, too. That reminds, <laughs> me, that reminds me of the, uh, the my first interview with Lonergan where I told him my proposals that I wanted to study on and instead of go to the classes at the Greg. Of course, I took the liberty of going to his classes while he was still there, even though I wasn't, that wasn't my class, but. Um, so you didn't go to your classes, but went to his classes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, and he gave me permission to do that because he understood the issue. But I talked about, I wanted to read Newman 
and I wanted to read Rahner, and I wanted to really read Insight. So with the first two proposals, he spent about 20 minutes talking about the advantages of reading the other two. And then he said, well, about Insight, um, it'll put a little order into your life. What a joke. <laughs> I, I, it didn't put too much order into my life, but still, I've learned and, and uh, gotten so much out of it in my life. But, but the other thing is, uh, Lonergan used to say, he used to be, uh, his courses were not that easy. The subject matters weren't easy and his courses weren't easy. He was the best Latinist at the at the council, um, not at the council, but at the, in the Greg. It, but it's funny because at the same time at the council, they were saying that uh, the Benedictine bishop from England, his name slips me right now, was the best Latinist. He and Cardinal Gracious were the best Latinists at the council. All the Latin Americans and Italians and so forth. Germans didn't touch him. So anyway, I think that was Hume, right? Basil Hume? No. No, I think his first name was Basil, but not Hume. No. But your may have been later. He, he, he also was a Benedictine, wasn't he? Right. He, no, it was uh, another person. I can't remember his name. At any rate, um, so the seminary setup is is. Is, is really uh, a disaster. And I think that's what um, some, some inkling of that is what occurred to your father when he told you that, Ned. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I had a little taste of the difference between some kinds of education and others, because when I took philosophy, the philosophy professor said, well, we're not going to go into this too much because you're going to have it in theology. And then when you get to theology, they say, well, we're not going to go into this too much because you've already had it in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're bereft in both cases. <laughs> but, so, I mean, it, uh, to turn theology uh, as faith-seeking understanding into kind of higher-level catechism uh, yeah. is really is really a tragedy. Yeah, and not to not to encourage people to ask questions. So I, I do remember one thing that was high on the authorities' minds that in our seminary system was intellectual pride. Yeah. The sign of intellectual pride was asking too many questions. It was? If you put the kibosh on on asking questions, what the hell do you think you're going to turn out when it comes to hierarchy? In other words, we it's always been remarked that American bishops are particularly good at building schools and things like that, but not too good at not too good at uh, the intellectual aspect. That was one of the wonderful things. You mentioned Courtney Murray being the Paritus of, uh, of, the Spelman. of New York. There, there's a book by Stephen Birmingham, whose title I forgot, but he has this section on, on um, that, what was the name of that archbishop in, in New York at the time? Spellman. Yeah. About Spellman's father telling him before he left for the seminary, uh, try to always hang around people who are smarter than you. And in your case, that won't be too hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was shrewd, if not intelligent. Oh, of course. They're calculators rather yeah. than. That's one of my 
themes I'm harping on these days with the, uh, the technicization of everything, having algorithms figure, figure out your strategies rather than you deliberating. Because technical expertise is about figuring out means, the most efficient means to further means. But the means you're figuring out the means for are going to become means themselves. Mm -hmm. Whereas deliberation is figuring out the means that's in line with in line with the fact that for the sake of which you're living your whole life and decide making every decision you live. Yeah. But people don't really see the difference and are taught not to see the difference because deliberation in the serious sense or practical wisdom in the serious sense is, is, uh, fall, has fallen into desuetude, you could say, along with confession. So, um, so that, that, that's a novel thing. Uh, I think when I look back on our junior seminary days, uh, I had kind of extraordinary relationships with some of the uh, our teachers. And by and large, it was really edifying for me. Father Barr, he used to come into my dorm on weekends when nobody was there. And we'd talk. Um, and he, he, he was funny, but he could deliberate. And he said one of the most important things I, I recall from his whole litany of sayings, which was that confidence is that feeling you have before you really understand the situation. <laughs> that sounds like bar, yep. That's, that's the kind of confidence that our bishops have. <laughs> <laughs> they want to stay that way. <laughs> In Europe, I got the chance to uh, come to know Cardinal Martini. Really? Who had been the uh, rector of the Biblicum. Uh, and, and also um, the Cardinal Archbishop of Germany, who had been a, uh, an assistant to, to uh, Rahner in his early life. Uh, but in his older life, when people wanted to do a festschrift in his honor, he said, don't do it in honor of me, do it in honor of Hans Urs von Balthasar. Well, in the United States, you'd have kids in your class who you were either for Rahner or Balthazar or Lonergan and more or less the curse on other houses. Where here is Lehman saying, no, no, you, anyone who's great, you want to learn from both of them and you admire both of them. And so I admired, always have admired Rahner and Balthazar, uh, even though I'm an enthusiast for Lonergan. So, so um, uh, guys like live wires like Phil Berryman and and uh, and Jerry Fallon and a few others, they they really were uh, interested in the fact that I was interested. <laughs> uh, my friendship with Berryman as well as with Fallon has gone on till Fallon died and now Berryman's still a very close friend. Um, but when I, I, we had a Lonergan workshop in, in the Diocese of Mainz <coughs> where Cardinal Lehmann was the ordinary and we had it, we had to have it during the Christmas break. So we were there um, before the, our workshop actually started uh, for New Year's. And so I went to the New Year's uh, celebration in the cathedral at Mainz. And Cardinal Lehmann, uh, when he went up to the podium, uh, he, he gave a talk on the state of the world, the state of the nation, 
which I could not get over. I couldn't think of even one of our professional politicians who could have, could have done what he did. He was just a brilliant guy. And, and so the, the seminaries in Germany and Holland and so forth were so different from, from what are standard seminaries in the States and so forth. Um, because one of the things you prove is most of, in my experience, both in the Protestant University, which is Basel, and in the German Catholic universities, was that most of the theologians had a lot of pastoral experience. And what a difference that would make. Um, and another, I know that Vincentians and Sulpicians have a pastoral orientation, but they don't really have the day-to-day -day experience of the sheep, so to speak. But in Germany, they did. Karl Barth did, and all the other theologians. Uh, so um, well, that made a great difference in the way they taught everything. Um, and, it, and, it, and it gave their vocation as theologians a, a, a seriousness, which I don't think was manifested in the average um, seminary theology. Of course, every seminary tended to have some really brilliant guy, like the uh, guys from Baltimore had Raymond Brown, and the guys from D Dunwoody, the New York diocese, they had their great scripture scholar. And the interesting thing was, uh, in terms of the big guys at their schools, that they all tended to go into scripture studies and to break with the uh, wrong kind of study of scripture, which was a historical and uh, not scholarly, scholar didn't have scholarly responsibility to the to the to the data and so forth, but. But not every seminary had those. <laughs> uh, we could think of one that didn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame. But what, what luck to have gotten into a place where, where you did have a lot of serious people. Um, and so it's luck. But so I think. Uh, certainly the Jesuits are extraordinary. Um, but there are uh, not so hot Jesuits too um, who don't have a real intellectual life, um, are really not asking and answering questions. Mm. And and uh, so I think, I suppose you'd have that with any congregation, but in the Jesuits, you do have that tradition of cultivating your intelligence. And that, as you know, is absent from most diocesan seminaries where the bishops come from. Oh. Now, you could have the opportunity that Tom had uh, of being sent to Rome uh, and George and Larry Shelburne and people were sent to Rome. There was a, you had a shot there. Um, <laughs> sure. well, as you know, Rome could also be seen as the dead center of Roman Catholicism. Right, with the emphasis <laughs> on dead, huh? Dead well, center, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. Say what, what, you know, I fought, I, I wasn't sent so much as I fought really to go and study liturgy, which was not popular in LA at that time. Uh, it was dangerous. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I really wanted to go to Catholic U. Uh, 
um, or Notre Dame. And they said, no, no, no. If you're going to go, we'll let you go for one year uh, to Rome, to the, you know, where, where it's, quote, safe. And so I found it an extremely good experience simply because that was where people from all over the world gathered. And so I was in day-to-day -day contact, not just with a certain rarefied ethnic group, but with people from everywhere. That's and to me, that was the, you know, in my humble estimation at San Anselmo at that time, the academics were moderately good. There were some really, really great pioneers, but, uh, the academics in general were, you know, you could read their notes in Italian and sleep through their classes or whatever. But uh, uh, it, it, it was the contact outside of um, outside of the uh, the institutional structures that really, to me, I found life giving. That was that was a tremendous thing about being in Rome during the council. Yeah, because people from all over the world were there, and Pariti from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So you could go to a briefing by Skilabek, let's say, uh, and another day you could hear De Lubac, and it's just amazing uh, the the. the the, the amount of how they would go into the issues and a way of framing the issues. Another thing that really impressed me about the council was that the structure of the thing was that certain people, once they got rid of the uh, official things from Rome, the dead debt center, <laughs> uh, they started having people who were competent in the different fields, right? The, write the first drafts and the bishops would read the first drafts and the more intelligent bishops would comment on them and not all the not all the more intelligent bishops were singing in unison mm -hmm. some of them had important objections or changes that they wanted made and i thought it was interesting that the minority voices didn't get just canceled out and in fact, um, there was a specifically conservative Italian council, uh, Cardinal, I mean, who was there, who had a lot of influence because he was on the main committee. And I, and I remember... Um, Gara Taviani? No, it, but he was important, but he, he wasn't uh, too outspoken. Uh, he was really more of a holy guy. Uh, than one of these operators. Hmm. So, so um, is the guy you're thinking of? Was he from Palermo? I, I, uh, I just read something the other day about o Ottaviani was, you know, Semperidem, which was his Episcopal motto. <laughs> but that um, uh, this guy from Palermo was the real, you know bruiser in the trenches uh, and I, his name starts with a p i, I can't uh, think I think you, of i know who you mean and i can't think of it either uh, yeah, he, was big, he was big especially on liturgy and he was associated with the uh center for documentation where the leader was a an italian guy named dosetti i don't know whether you uh learned anything about him while you were in Rome, Tom. I don't recall. But he was an extraordinary priest and and uh, had a great influence on the council. Also, it wasn't Cardinal Lercaro? No, not the not the guy I'm thinking of. But, okay. um, but, yes. well, Lercaro was definitely a pastoral man who was forward moving, wasn't he? Yes, yes, very much. Yeah. But at any rate, um, uh, what I heard was uh, that 
one of the most radical Pariti, they would be considered radical, but they weren't radical in a, in a very serious sense, but they would have been considered radical in that context. But he went right over in the, after the last session um, of the, of the uh, council and met that priest. He begins with, his name begins with an A, but I can't remember what it is. And he, and he thanked him for his interventions during the council rather than, and I felt uh, uh, the feeling was that it was genuine thanks. And I thought it was a tremendous mark of the church that you, you didn't even have the possibility of what we have in our um, Capitol building today of people taking sides and trying to get the power to outvote the other side and so forth and so on that they really introduced the modifications of people who are conservative and they respected their opinions, not, not, to, not necessarily always, but very much. And I thought that was really a wonder, that was edifying for me. Um, now, Fred, after the council, we had concilium, and then there was a spin-off Communio. With com Communio. And were you involved in any way with that? Uh, with not, the, I mean, I was a reader of all. Yep. But not a, uh, not a, I was, I'm really not a well known theologian, um, except in small circles. So, so uh, no, I was not. I know David Tracy was. David Tracy was one of the older guys at the Greg who, along with our own uh, diocesan Frank Colburn, mm -hmm. uh, who last mm -hmm. parish from St. Andrews in Pasadena. Yeah. Right. He, he, uh, he's one of the guys who, I think because he didn't come to the seminary from our seminary, but he came to the seminary from Detroit where you were allowed to ask questions more frequently. So how did this, how did they let you read that paper on a sense of wonder? Oh, I didn't. I mean, I, 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 I hope I manifested that I had wonder, but I never, uh, do you know that paper? I remember the talk. And it lit some good discussion among our classmates. Wonderful. So oh, yeah. in particular for me. So tell us something about yourself, John. You've been the most silent. Well, I'm a sponge. Um, but uh, I was able to work in East LA around homeboy <laughs> industries. And I was a teacher of at-risk high school, uh, sponsored by a uh, religious uh, program that was following a lot on what uh, Greg Boyle was doing, and uh, that was that was my last eleven years. Um, and then I got into parish work after I retired. <clears throat> And uh, that's where Gene O'Toole was my mentor with adult faith formation. Um, sadly, in the Diocese of Orange, uh, the clergy have been pushing out the laity from catechist formation and RCIA and such. And uh, that's been kind of a sad piece. Uh, but recently I got an invite to go back to the parish and get more involved after four or five years of more or less. Uh, did you know Ralph Platts? Oh yeah. Uh, Ralph I helped. Know, but I know, I know that Jerry Fallon was a personal friend of his. Yeah. Well, uh, Ralph was very, very helpful at uh, 
faith formation at our parish here. And he told me and others that he had offered his services to a number of parishes and uh, he was just, excuse me, too fucking smart and scared the priests or pastors out. But we had Don Romito. Did you know him, Tom? Yeah, I did from uh, campus ministry days. And Don Romito, uh, I introduced Ralph to Romito, who was our pastor. And he came to me <laughs> an hour later and said, whatever you do, get this guy. He is so good. And so Ralph had about six years of uh, really great work in um, RCIA and adult faith formation and uh, Bible study. So I've been, I've been blessed with the uh, uh, semi-retirement uh, parish involvement. Uh, um, did, did you have anything to do with Herbert Ryan too? I had one amazing time. Shavira, you remember when you asked me to drive him home Yes, from the wedding of course and i had about two hours and he really nailed it uh, essentially johnny don't worry about big vocations like priesthood and laity he said look at the 20 little vocations you've got every day and um i think that that illustrated for me why the I, I think so many of the Jesuits have that sense of the small voc small vocations all day long, which I think Pope Francis shares. And that's very Ignatian. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a version of meeting God in all things. And there's Richard Rohr, who was another one. Uh, we put the Jesuit and the Franciscan together. Yes, yes. Yeah, he's wonderful. I, uh, when, when, you, when Herbert Ryan was your mentor, did that last only while you were at uh, Loyola, Ned and? No, um, Fred, uh, um, bo both our sons went to, uh, my sons went to um, Marymount, Loyola Marymount. And while there, <clears throat> uh, I met uh, a student who, uh, a lawyer, who had uh, gone from Loyola to Harvard and had been guided throughout his career there at Loyola by Herb Ryan. Uh, his name was uh, Bonifacio Garcia. And uh, Bonnie wanted me to meet Herb. And this is, uh, you know, I'm practicing law. Bonnie is practicing law. George Crook is practicing law. And, and uh, I had the opportunity to, to meet uh, uh, Father Ryan and instantly liked him uh, and invited him to our home. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I invited other folks that I thought would be uh, very interested in, in uh, hopefully forming a relationship with uh, Father Ryan. And George Crook was one of them. And uh, uh, George asked him a very uh, good and personal question during that uh, living room group conversation that uh, sort of began uh, his friendship with, with uh, Herb. So the, the friendship developed. This, this was during my fallen away Catholic period, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, so really, uh, I was introduced by uh, this lawyer. <laughs> Uh, who knew Herb very, very well. Uh, I introduced George to Herb, and um, very, 
I think it was fairly quickly that we began to visit uh, a lot. And uh, George, you can describe it much better than I can, obviously. Uh, but uh, George's coming back to the church was was very, very uh, tied in with his growing relationship with with Herb. And uh, oh, to understand it, <laughs> yeah, and and a lot of my development, uh, as as uh, John uh, Grimmer has intimated. Uh, was uh, through my friendship with and, and uh, counseling from uh, Herb. Uh, uh, can I suggest something? Sure. I'm noticing the time, and uh, as a mediator, when I would meet with people, I do it. <laughs> I would do a timeline. So on the left would be everything we've talked about. 1963. Fred's going across the ocean in a boat, uh, blah, 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 the Vatican Council. So here we are at 2021. Father Ryan has passed on. Eugene O'Toole has passed on. Yeah. Here's the seven of us. I'm counting you in, Sue, as the lone, <laughs> the lone genuine evangelical <laughs> of the group. And I say that with all due respect and uh, Nice validation, George. Yes. Uh, she's the one that's, when I asked her, why is she over here? She said, oh, the Lord, the Lord told me to come. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, about the Lord, uh, Christianity, Fred, I remember you were d distinguishing between churchianity and Christianity. So, <laughs> so Sue was the first exemplar of Christianity. From the Episcopal viewpoint, so, but, but going forward, you know, our mentors have died, and here we are. I remember when I was in my career, you know, I had some wonderful people over me. Hugh McIsaac, who was a pioneer of mediation in California, and he moved on. And finally, I got to the point where I said, "Hey, I don't have anybody who's a mentor to me. I'm supposed to be a mentor to other people." So I had to kind of become a mentor to staff uh and accept that role so so what do we do fred uh what can we you know one of the the best chapters of the book in your honor is by randall rosenberg that's probably my favorite chapter sean copeland but it's he wrote about friendship through text and he writes about walker percy i don't know if you had a chance to read that book by in your honor <laughs> have you read that not, you, no. Yeah, you should read Rosenberg's article. Well, I did. I did uh, peruse that. Yeah, it's a very good one. It's about how. It really is a. Uh, excuse me, George. Yeah, kind of a shared uh, conversation that they had over books. You know, both Walker Percy's dad committed suicide, and then Horton, his best friend, mm -hmm. lost his father, and an uncle, Will. Percy yeah. was like their uncle and he told them what to read and guided them and introduced them to music and beauty and but the whole thing is about how friendship through texts a literary appropriation of Aristotle and friendships with and around texts T-E-X-T-S and he doesn't mean texts on the phone uh, he's talking about written literature reading yeah. Dante or somebody saying you should read this book this is really for you etc cetera, etc cetera. so going ahead into the future what do you do you have any thing you would recommend fred uh maybe all of us have our own operating system and our software already installed for our future years whatever they remain but uh do you have any suggestion on something that you know writing or a theologian or What's what what turns you on these days? Or oh well, I mean, is I, it the the women feminist theologians or Sean Copeland or Ilya Delio or no no? It's, right now I'm uh, Lonergan's second great work was Method in Theology, right? Well, but it, uh, 
this year, next year actually, will be the 50th anniversary of the publication of that. So I'm part of a group that's writing a book uh, for the sake mainly of theology grad students about about method. So I'm preparing to do that. By right now, I'm translating for myself notes that I underline in Gadamer's early work on dialectic. Uh -huh. So the big contrast between dialectic and heuristic is that you've all been in conversations where the point of the conversation of your interlocutor is to persuade you that they're right. But the dialectician uh, thinks of a big question in the middle of the table for which he has opinions and he thinks they're right. But he really actually wants to learn more about it from his interlocutors. Uh -huh her interlocutors and and then the, the begin at the beginning you suppose that maybe the other person will come come along to agree with you but in dialectic you're supposed to be open to learning from the other person and 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 that seems to me critical uh -huh. i i uh Lonergan once told me in one of our conversations through the years that people ask him, well, how do, you, how do you know all this stuff? And he said, I read books. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, he's a friend of texts uh, and the author's <laughs> texts, really. So, so, um, so, so it's a constant learning that we're doing, and you you try to deepen the learning, and that's that's kind of what I'm trying to do because Lonergan's pivotal chapter, but not the most important in method, uh, has to do with first you have establishing the text, and you have interpreting and then the history of the interpretation of texts and of other things, and finally you have dialectics. And dialectics for Lonergan is taking into account that you don't just have a, a theory or a, 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 your own special interpretation of something, but whatever you do have to say is an expression of your own self-understanding. Mm -hmm. And that's always at play. And so Lonergan says you're, you're meeting the other and trying to understand where they're coming from in terms of what they're intellectually or morally or religiously converted. And, and, uh, and you'll have disagreements about interpretations that where you, you might have a better, the person missed something and you can tell them what they missed or vice versa. But this encounter, which really is involved is really to end up with all the places where you have agreements to build on. And, and, uh, and so that's related. That I'm going to talk about dialectic and Lonergan, but also the traditional Socratic Platonic dialectic. Uh -huh. and this is, this is uh, in the context of my, my own preoccupation with that thing I mentioned to you before about getting uh, not getting away from technical expertise because that's indispensable but at least adding deliberation and part of deliberation and this is where I think what you guys have been saying about the Jesuits is tremendously important and the spiritual exercises after the after reaching a kind of culmination of examination of your own life and your own failings, you have this uh, opportunity to make a choice between the two standards. And this is from the 
Spanish days of two farm, two, two armies fighting against each other mm -hmm. and, and holding up the standards so you could see where your, your friends versus your enemies are. And one is the standard of Satan and the other is the standard of Christ. And, and so what you're really going to do is figure out everybody has a that for the sake of which they decide and do everything they do. And whatever it is, it's their God. And their God could be an idol. On the other hand, it could be God. So when George says he's fallen away from the church, I never think for a moment that his that for the sake of which was a God and the good of other people. So, so I, ne I would never worry about anyone like George falling away from the church, in quotes. So, so, um, so, so, that, so it's the discovery of the that for the sake of which. Every single person on account of the cross of Christ is offered, and to some extent, insofar as they're doing the right thing, receives the gift of the Spirit. But the gift of the Spirit can ongoingly give you the impulse to do this or that thing, which is good. And I see, I, I, I'm teaching a course this semester, I had last semester, 41 kids. 29 of whom are Chinese. Hmm. Chinese people taking it at BC and eight or nine of them taking it in China. And as one of these Chinese people told me in a year before, all my life before I came here, I never heard about God. So I've been emphasizing God's universal and unconditional love for everyone, no matter what the, their state is. That's the most important thing in their lives. That's the most important thing to communicate. And it doesn't demand or require that a person has the opportunity or the fact of having fallen in love with Jesus. So, so and that's the kind of generosity that Jesus is expressing. Uh, and uh, on the cross. So, so, so um, I think it's important to try to figure out how, how you access uh, what it is within you that's either moving you towards or away from the real that for the sake of which, which would be God. And the, the Jesuits have that front and center. So they have their intellectual apostolate, which I say, which I think is indispensable and overwhelmingly neglected by the organized church for the most part. But on the other hand, you have the exercises, the daily examen, and so forth and so on, which, which, which orients you day by day. And if you have both of those together, that's, that's a wonderful thing, no matter what your talents or skills may be. So, so <clears throat> that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at with regard to, with regard to dialectics. Because dialectics, if it's done well and done in a friendly way, and I want to emphasize that, not a competition to win an argument, but a, a, a a dedication to listening. So E.M. Forrester has that awful line in one of his novels, I can't remember which, in which he says, poor little talkative Christianity. <laughs> and, I, and, I think, and I think, oh yeah, the religion that talks but never listens. Uh, that's <laughs> not together true. But those who are, those who are, uh, really serious about their spiritual life, however they call that, do tend to be listeners, the kind of listeners who uh, change people's lives just by the fact that you're actually paying attention to them in a serious way. So <clears throat> so that's, that's my preoccupation. And it's going to have to do with 
being intellectually, morally, religiously converted. And the religious conversion, although you may not think of it by name and by a certain standard, it's the condition of the possibility, I think, of being really genuinely intellectually or morally converted. So, so, so that's what dialectic's heading for. But it has to be genuine dialectic, which has a great deal to do with listening. So Fred, if we, well, two things come to mind. I get the image of a jigsaw puzzle that we're all around this table with the question mark in the middle and you put your pieces down on the table and uh, <clears throat> a Buddhist next to you puts his or her pieces down and we all put the pieces down. So you may end up still believing in your pieces, but these other pieces may add something to the total understanding. So you say, wow, this was much bigger than I thought it was, or there's more to this than I thought. Is this that is, kind of it? This is what my friend George does. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I did in mediation, metaphors. Uh, so secondarily, so if we go out and buy this book, Fred, uh, that your chapter will be part of, what percentage do you give us of understanding understanding it? Is it worth our getting? Because we're not in academia. We're kind of academics in the spirit. Maybe more genuine academics than others are. Who knows? Uh, well, George, maybe you could, uh, are, are you able to photocopy anything? Uh, yeah. You could photocopy Rosenberg's chapter. Yeah. Share it with us. Maybe we could talk about it next. next. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah. Fred, can you do this again? Yeah, I'd be happy to do it. I mean, ever since I said I would do it, I've been longing for it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> happy day. Sue, check are, that out, Sue. Why are we flattered? No. <laughs> so, so, Sue, I just want to say that, uh, uh, Sue, are you still there? Is Sue gone? No, no she's I'm there. Here. I'm here. Hi, hear. Sue. Hi. Are you still a young lifer? Uh, well, no, not, not officially, but you would always be, uh, you know, I'd always tell anybody that I thought, could do the benefit, I would tell them about Yen Lai. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think way back in the Lonergan and some of those days, yeah, they met Jim Raper and loved him too. And he loved the seminarians he met. One of his favorite quotes that I recall is, it's a sin to bore yeah. a kid with the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. So, so do you have any church home that you go to when you go to church? Could we maybe get Sue to sit next to Fred? Next time. Yeah, both in the same picture. <clears throat> He's thinking. We haven't gone back yet. We're waiting until after the workshop. Uh, in, in the workshop. third full week of June. And, they can listen to all and you would all be welcome to do that. To do what, Fred? To, to join this. Oh. If you want to of the Lonergan workshop. When is that? How do we do that? It's the third full week in June. And I can send the person who is in I get the uh, Lonergan email list to add your names to it. Not that you need there's any obligation or whatever. Or 
but you, you'd certainly be welcome. I'm sure you would enjoy part of it. Um, one of the things that happened this year is that two uh, overwhelmingly great Lonergan scholars uh, and so to speak workers in the vineyard like bringing out the collected works of Lonergan in one case. Uh, so that's Bob Doran, a Jesuit from Milwaukee uh, who used to be head of the Lonergan Center in, in Toronto. And, uh, and Philip McShane, who's a uh, Irish uh, former Jesuit, who is an expert in math and the sciences, who feels like most of, most of the people involved with Lonergan studies haven't even started yet. Um, but he has really uh, coached a lot, of, a lot of people in a tremendous way. Um, they both died this year. So we're going to have papers that involve honoring them. Uh, but uh -huh. it's a paper uh, in honor rather than a tribute. Uh, that'll be fine. And some of them are just going to be tributes. So so that's one of the things that's for sure going to happen this, this coming year. But not everybody's doing that. Mm -hmm. But Tom Halloran, you remember Tom? Remember Tom? Tom Halloran? Yeah. yeah. I know. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. How could I say that? It would only be George who could remember him because he was the only one at North American College. At any rate, he's going to give a, a tribute to Phil. You'll at least, you might remember him when you see him. Uh, if you see, but no, no, no worries. But I'll forward, if it's okay with you guys, your emails to Mary, who is taking care of that for us, and you'll get the prompt for when it comes. Yeah. So it's the type of thing where one could pick and choose what talks one wants to listen to. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she's still working out the schedule, which we used to do, uh, because she gets around to everybody over Zoom to see when they'll be available. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as we do have a schedule, I'll, I'll email it to you guys. Okay. Great. So, so my final question is, how do you and Sue get to give out pizza to everybody that attend the con? <laughs> Because both of you have partnered in being such hospitable hosts. We have to abstain. <laughs> so uh, you do too. Uh, but never, so, thanks for the happy memory. <laughs> so Fred, you're, uh, are you still working full time at BC? Yes, God willing. And how long do you intend to do that? As long as I can. Well, good. I, I, I maintain retirement is a sign of, you know, a, a character defect. But uh, Thank you, George. <laughs> Betty doesn't agree with me, alas. But, um, so, um, they, they understand that. Yeah. Because it, um, it is a calling. And you do find that uh, somehow helpful to others. So like I'm, I'm directing a dissertation now uh, of a person who is a Lonergan, was going to do his dissertation on Lonergan, but after reading Laudato Si, he realized that people don't have, um, theologians in general don't have the equipment to, to uh, to understand the scientific things that go into taking care of the environmental crisis. So he, he's doing his dissertation on the ways that Lonergan could help a person navigate that problem hmm. uh, for Francis's sake. And not only for Francis's sake, but all of our sake. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, the last two chapters, one was 125 pages long 
and the other is was 116 pages. So, um, so that took a lot of uh, work for me, uh, but it's such a pleasure to be able to teach first people like that. So one, wonderful people. And uh, as long as I can do it, I'm going to keep doing it. Great. Yeah, it, it sounds like you want to continue being part of the conversation. True. Here with us. True. Yes. Yes, I Wonderful. do. Wonderful. 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 <laughs> we'll get you back. Um, Fred, at the beginning of our conversation, you were talking about your limited uh, engagement with your LA classmates for the seminary. Or, and it reminded me of something I'll tell you about in a minute. But it, I read you as saying you had also no great enthusiasm for seeing some of them. Um, and I interpreted that as you were sort of either didn't remember them fondly or you regarded yourself as alienated from some of them or was I at all right in those interpretations? Sue, Sue wants to say something. Well, just that he never told me that about his time in LA. And I've lived with him a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> My my cohorts, I, I really was glad to be with all of them in different ways. Uh, I, I remember we had a fellow in my class uh, who really was, was a strange guy. His name was Dale Asbury. I remember him very well. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and he used to be really bullied by bullied by people. Yes. And he used to come and talk with me about that. And uh, and I, I I I spent hours and hours walking around with him and talking. And I I, I feel so grateful that I had the opportunity to do that with him. Uh, and I feel happy that he came to me to do that. Um, but it just is the thing that as you get older, uh, you know that people have died. And among them, Dale, incidentally. And, and, and what happens to me is my memory isn't as good as it should be. So it isn't out of disregard, but it is just the fact that certain people stand out in a way that others probably didn't. And it didn't have anything to do with disregard for them. I see. Uh, okay. I thought they were really uh, a wonderful group. And when I went to Rome, uh, as George knows, we were sent to Rome. We were with other seminarians who were sent by their bishops. And I often thought to myself during those years I was there that these people weren't really as inquisitive by and large as my class. Mm. So, so it was an interesting experience because everybody else had the sense that they were now on the level in which they should be on a level. But I didn't have that feeling. Uh, and I remember very clearly being very sad with the idea that I was leaving them. So, so uh, and one of the reasons why I started the Lonergan workshop, I thought was out of fidelity to them so that maybe they could join and take part in it, uh, in something that I had uh, had the good fortune to, to be involved with. So, so I've, al I've always uh, uh, wanted to be a better friend contact and have never been organized enough to do it. So um, it's my one of my uh, negative qualities. But it, uh, a wonderful thing I can say, uh, and I don't know whether this is true for you, George, my, my, the beetle of my class 
organizes a periodic meeting with my NAC class. A lot have passed away and uh, so forth and are busy in ways they can't always attend, but I, I've been attending that. And it's always a great consolation. Many of them are just like this group, people who have left and gone on to other things and directly priestly work, but all of them obviously have a vocational uh, approach. The, uh, every, I teach in a perspectives program that I helped to found. And I, it used to be, you know, from the Bible to Nietzsche, but I, I am in the third part of it now, which is on the uh, horizons in the new social sciences. And we study political science, law, sociology, and economics. And um, we read uh, towards the end of the course two, two talks by uh, the great founder of sociology, one of the founders, Max Weber. And one is called uh, Science as a Vocation, which and in German science is also scholarship, you know, quite the same. And the other is uh, politics as a vocation. And I, and I, um, and, and that's really interesting to me because I remember the person who was going to be my dissertation director, we call him Dr. Vater, uh, brought all his students together out at his house. And the reason why he invited us all, all, all out there was to say that he had had a, a call from the uni another university. And he said he was in the process of trying to figure out whether uh, the unroof, the call to the university, was uh, really a vocation. Uh, so, so that thing of vocation, I always talked about the vocation to, to my students. And uh, this is just an afterthought. One day, I, one of my colleagues met me on the stairway. And, and she, he had taught the same student that I had. And she was teaching in the school in <coughs> Chicago, a really bright and beautiful student. And uh, John asked her, well, why did you choose to do that? And she said, it was in the course that I took with Fred Lawrence, and he talked about vocation. And I thought, well, this is my vocation. And that's what led her to go there. So these kind of things pop up sound then in your life, as you guys already know. Sort of makes it a bit worthwhile, huh? Yes, it does. So, so anyway, that, that's a long-winded answer to whatever question there was. <laughs> I think it was George's question about retiring. <laughs> so, so, so you're a marathoner with your vocation. Yeah. Well, I'm lucky, you know, because yeah. some of my many of my early colleagues had to retire when they became 70. And that was, uh, that was an awful loss. Yeah. For this vocation, I'm not thinking it is for every vocation. Yeah. But I mean, now I hear that uh, George feels the same way about his work and probably all of you do in different ways. So, I mean, you, you all keep on going. And yeah, I don't see why not, and I don't care if not because that that could be appropriate for someone else. But uh, so what I'm trying to do, um, it's harder now, especially because of the uh, side effects of the pandemic. Uh, so I haven't I haven't really exercised enough, so I have trouble walking. Did you have it, COVID? No, oh, I never did. Oh, okay. But I was in strict quarantine here in my daughter's house, and uh, and 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 during the cold, I just didn't go out and walk enough. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I, 
I have COPD, chronic obstruction of the pulmonary disease. So I'm liable to have breathing problems when I just walk a little ways. So now I'm trying to build up again, but this is a, if you don't use it, you do lose it, so. <laughs> We've and noticed. I, yeah. yeah. And uh, as, as a friend of mine said, yeah, that's true from the neck up too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to tell this story. Uh, everybody in LA here has heard it, but do you remember who Don Newcomb was? Yeah, Don Newcomb was with the Dodgers, right? Wasn't he a pitcher or catcher? Pitcher. pitcher. First yeah. black major yeah. league pitcher. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. And he was a fastball thrower, a very, you know, a blazing fastball. And he came with him out to L.A. Um, and, you know, became he was a good pinch hitter, strangely, for a, a, a pitcher. But anyway, so at the end of his career, some reporter said to him during his twilight period, well, Nuke, I guess you're just not throwing as hard as you used to, huh? And Nukem says, no, I'm throwing as hard as I ever did. It just takes it longer to get to the plate. <laughs> Um, and that's kind of my view of my experience was, you know, I think my legal work's just as good. It, there's just not that much, of, there's much of it in a given day, you know. That reminds me of uh, huh? one of the announcers of the Red Sox for decades now. It's just a uh, store, storehouse of baseball lore. And the other day, I just happened to hear him talk about Newcomb played for many years in the Negro Leagues before mm -hmm. he went up for the Dodgers. Took him. And, and he, was a, he was a slugger. He was a great hitter. So that thing about the exception that you were talking about? Yeah. Like a good hitter. It really was something that he, that was something he had done in the Negro Leagues a great deal. Well, and at the end of his career, well, Alston, the manager here, used him as a pitch hitter. Hajai, not infrequently. Yeah, it's true. Yep. I remember one year as a pitch hitter, it, it, he was a pitcher. He had seven home runs. You know, well, how many pitchers had seven home runs <laughs> in this season? <clears throat> well, it was the person who had his contract renewed from year to year. I always thought that was interesting. Uh, I hollered for the Dodgers for a long time. Yeah, well, you're talking about Austin, right? Yeah, well, uh, one year contracts. I'm uh, now, shift, I've shifted to the Red Sox. Well, it's okay. It's a different league, you know, so it's a lateral <laughs> transfer. Yeah, and it took you long <laughs> enough. That's fine. <laughs> You did it reluctantly, you know. <laughs> Baseball just gives one just such a world of metaphor, doesn't it? It's just a, a, a amazing thing. Yes. Have you been a pinch hitter in law? Um, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay. Well, it would depend how you define it, but, you know. Um, was the name of the cardinal you were fishing for a while ago at the Vatican Council, Ruffini? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's him. Yep. I spent, I've spent time looking for it on the internet because I just read about him a week ago. He oh, said yeah. he was the real Otavian. You know, he could actually win some of those battles. Yeah, that's right. Otaviani was nothing, not not anything, if not always defeated, right? At the Vatican Council. You know, I'm wondering if now that George Crook has tied up the last remaining loose end, if maybe at 1225, it might be time for us to... Uh, say, until the, until the next time. Yeah, that's a good idea. Right, let's head to the On dugout. On that happy note. Mm -hmm.
on that happy note. Well, Fred, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. It's been delightful, Fred. Thank you. I'm glad this is going to uh, be uh, uh, at least uh, somewhat occurring time thing. Yeah. It's okay. impossible for you to photocopy that. Yes. Chapter and send it to us. Okay. I'll do that. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I we'll think all like be looking forward to the follow up and whatever we do, the five of us next week. Uh, we'll be planning email wise. Great. Uh, good. Sounds good. Tom. Okay. Well, you know, uh, uh, George, you might be able to avoid the burden of making copies if you if you could scan it and then email it to us. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Okay. I'm yeah scan good. it. Yeah. Make a copy, scan it, and send it to you. Yeah, attach it to an email. Doesn't that sound yeah. impressive, Fred, that I was able to say that? Luddite that I am. <laughs> and is that is that legal? Uh, of course. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, it's Fred's book, so and he inspired the article, so so we'll use Epikaya here. The uh, no, isn't there something about fair use? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know that law. Yeah, about copyright. So fair, like, now, fair use covers a multitude of sins. As yeah, long as you is, don't make a fortune off of it. Yeah. Yeah. Roughly oh, speaking. Tom, would you email me that code you used to break into the Catholic Herald and read stuff without a subscription? Outline.com. Outline.com. Outline.com, and then copy and paste the URL. And, Plus URL, okay. And some, it doesn't always work, but sometimes it will get you over the paywall. <laughs> yeah, okay. speaking of doubtlessly illegal things. So well, this but is my George. Heart is pure. My heart George is, is pure. George is pinch hitting there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My strength is as the strength of 10 because my heart is pure. Oh. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> On that happy note, may I push the end button and okay. say good Absolutely. Night. God bless all. Okay. okay. Gracie. Bye. Thanks very much. God bless. Say, say good night, Gracie.